Welcome back to today's final squeeze of a splash of paint, where it's time for a new feature to help you get the most out of your camera and take some great reference photographs that can be worked up into paintings on a later date. Let's leave the studio and go on location to Polter Country Park in the Derbyshire countryside for a closer look at some simple tips and techniques for capturing more than the eye can see. Hello and welcome to Polter Country Park in Langworth in Derbyshire. What a brilliant place for watercolour painting. Massive choice of scene. But if you're looking at a vista this size, how do you know what scene to choose? It's a difficult thing choosing the right composition. And a compact camera is the perfect tool for this. The screen on the back makes a brilliant picture finder. So what I'd like to do is give you one or two tips and tricks on how you can get the best composition out of your paintings. A really great compositional tool is adding foreground interest. Getting something like these reeds and putting them right in the foreground of your picture creates massive distance and it takes the viewer into the scene. So as I frame this photograph using the screen on the camera, so adding these reeds to the foreground area, to this corner, really makes all the sky and the trees just fly back into the distance. Using the zoom function obviously and getting a bit closer in and just placing maybe even dropping things a little bit lower and trying to get as much detail as I can right in the foreground of the scene. It's also the case over this side with some fantastic grasses what we can use. These grasses really make a fantastic foreground detail for the composition. So if I get quite a low shot of these, actually putting them really low down, making sure that the horizon is pretty straight and then pressing the shut to halfway which gives it a chance to focus and then taking the shot. Another useful feature as well is actually something called focus lock. Focus lock is a fantastic feature because you can press and hold the shutter halfway over the central portion and then reframe the image and take the shot. It makes a really good way of capturing foreground detail. The rule of thirds is a really important compositional trick, basically placing either a third landscape, two thirds sky, or vice versa. This pretty much guarantees perfect composition for your paintings or your photographs. Now, most cameras have a display button or option in the menu, which actually lets you turn a grid on the back of the camera. And I scroll through the options and eventually a grid appears, which does two things. It lets me place the third landscape and two thirds sky or vice versa but also it gives me the option of actually making sure that the horizon line is nice and straight and this is very important in a scene like this because we've got this nice rock edge as it goes across with a tree set on the top now if I place the bottom line of the third grid just on the top or the ridge of those rocks I can zoom in a touch and that will make a perfect composition so a very important thing to think about the rule of thirds. So there you go folks, hopefully that's given you some insight into composition, a few simple tips and tricks to improve your paintings and photographs. Think bad composition will completely throw the viewer out of the scene. Good composition makes a fantastic picture. Maybe think about Having a footpath that leads you into the scene or a roadway always adds extra. It takes people into the picture. If your camera has got settings that you're not sure how to turn on, get on the internet, folks, and give it a search. I'll see you next time. OK, for this exercise, I'm going to show you how to do a tree using negative shapes, just so it's slightly less contrived. OK, I've already primed the canvas and it's processed magenta. That way it's going to contrast very nicely against the greens I apply. OK, so I'm going to use a two inch Skyflow brush. I've damped it down a little bit just so the paint runs a bit, a bit better. And I'm going to start with sap green, some phthalo green, cadmium yellow, and just a little bit of burnt sienna. And really all I want to do is start applying streaks of colour in interesting ways. 
So some dark green. Okay, so the general perception when it comes to painting trees conventionally is that you'll paint the sky and then you'll paint the trees on top of the sky. So in negative shapes, you'll paint the shape of the tree or roughly get an idea where you want to fit it on the canvas. And then you're going to use the sky to start carving out some really interesting shapes. Okay, so I need a bit more paint on my brush. And again, I want to look for very, very interesting drags of colour. I don't particularly just want green on my brush, which is why I'm going to dip into some burnt sienna, maybe some yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, cerulean blue, just so there's interesting mixes on my brush. And just drag them where I want the tree to be on my canvas. And again, if I use the paint quite thick, I'm going to get some really interesting, lovely streaks coming through. I want to get some idea of where the light's going to hit the tree, so maybe on this corner we'll use a little bit more yellow. I've still got a fair bit of green on my brush, so we'll just drag the yellow over this side and it mixes in with the greens I've already applied just to create some sense of light skimming that corner and we'll drag some of the colour down. Now once I, I feel the tree starting to take shape, I'm, in fact, I'm just going to use some darker colours in this corner just to perceive the light and dark a little bit better. And again, interesting shapes. And I'm using deep violet, phthalo green, process cyan, and again, just doing dabs of dark here and there. And I'll use this dark also for the trunk. I'm putting the trunk in at an angle, just so it's more interesting than just having it straight. And we'll just lay a ground underneath. Okay. Right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use a clean um, two-inch Skyflow brush to start applying the sky. And again, this is slightly damp as well. And I want loads of white on my brush. And I'm going to use a little bit of Process Cyan with the white and a little bit of Cadmium Yellow. That way, some colours come through in the white and just make the white a little bit more interesting. And I've got to use quite a bit of paint to try and penetrate some of the darks that I've included so far. Okay, so again, large strokes. That way they're a lot more interesting and I can drag the paint fairly close to the green. The process magenta comes through nicely in little pockets and again starts to contrast against other colours. So this is where the negative shape comes through much more effectively because I can find just very interesting uncontrived marks which coincidentally create far more interesting shapes than if I were to just lay in lots of dabby marks for leaves. At the very end I'll use one or two just to tighten up a couple of areas but really it's a very quick impression to give you an idea how using an uncontrived method can actually create interest Okay, so I've worked on the outside. We'll just do this top area and then I'll find little pockets of light inside the tree. I'm still using the two inch sky flow and I'm just going to find certain pockets of sunlight breaking through the tree. And again, it will form hopefully interesting flecks of color and highlights hopefully to draw shapes forward and I can use the very tip of the brush for some very small flecks of light that will contrast against the larger ones. One of the reasons you look for certain approaches in art when you're painting certain things, so for example, a tree is a natural forming thing, so I'm trying to find something uncontrived. If I was painting a building, maybe I would want something very contrived for the sharp edges, but for a tree, again, it's really to do with trying to find something that looks spontaneous without being too forced. So at the end now, I'm just dabbing in some tiny little marks. I've got to load quite a bit of white paint on this brush, really to find interesting contrasts of smaller marks. And what I can do is just go down to a one and a half inch brush with some lemon yellow, some cadmium yellow, maybe a touch of white, 
and I can just lighten again just some smaller pockets of leaves where the sunlight's just skimming this corner. And again, it's all about discovering another way of doing something that you would see every day in a slightly fresh and unique manner. Okay, and that's pretty much it for this little demonstration. And again, it really helps to look for an in interesting method. That way you'll create a lot more interesting marks. I'm afraid that's nearly the end of today's programme, but before we go, we've just got time for a quick art bike project. Let's join versatile artist David Hyde as he demonstrates how to paint great grass using light and shade. Foregrounds can always be difficult. Today I'm going to show you a neat way to create some foreground grasses. What I've done in this um, little example painting is I've put some colour in the foreground just to get some interest. There's no real sense of grasses yet, but it's important to get some interest going. And I've used a couple of greens, some viridian, a little sap green. I've also used yellow on its own and blue on its own. When that's dry, we can layer on some darks and try to create a feeling of foreground grasses. I'm going to mix a dark green by using viridian and burnt umber. Now I put in quite a bit of burnt umber so that I remove as much as I dare of the green without actually losing the green. And of course this will give quite a strong tone so I'm going to lighten it with just a controlled amount of water until I feel it it should be okay. And then I'm going to look for areas that I can work on. Now I have to bear in mind that against darks, as in this part here, I need to leave my grasses light. And against the light on this part of the tree, I make my grasses dark. So I've got to just think about it a little bit as I create these edges. And what I'm looking for is a little bit of light, like in here, and I can turn that into grasses. This is a a number eight sable brush. I've got it loaded perhaps a little too much, so I'll reduce some of that. And if you paint down into that light like that, you create a feeling, if you can ignore that line, you create a feeling of light grasses growing against the shade there. Now, in order to make the illusion complete, all you need to do is soften out the top line which is this one, and so you have a soft line that blends itself into that part of the painting, leaving you these hard lines here to create the grasses. So uh, try and keep this sort of fairly random so that you're not making necessarily rows, um, but you can create some light grasses at will by doing that and just softening it out there. I'm being careful not to lose the light there because then that, you know, needs a little light there against the dark in the background. So you have to think about it a little bit, but by just picking anywhere and applying a little dark and then lightening it, lightening the top or softening the top, I make that a little darker. You can create that contrast and interest in the foreground that looks more textured like grass and also this extra con contrast and interest brings this forward in front of the uh, in front of the tree so it sort of places it more firmly close to you now you can also just use the tip of the brush and just paint some grasses dark against light and with the um, the sort of general effect of this you don't the brain doesn't necessarily notice that you're painting light against dark and dark against light it'll see it and just interpret it as a little grassy bank when you paint your grasses over here with this little bit of light because the light on the background here i'm just going to take some dark grasses out against that light and just leave those as dark against light so again i like to just work light against dark dark against light and just create those uh, foreground grasses. 
Thanks for that, David. Nice little tip there for adding some additional interest into your foreground and giving your paintings that great finishing touch. Now, before we wrap up today's program, we've just got time to pull another question from the Splash Your Paint post bag. Nick Bromley has been in touch. I've been trying to mix a good grey to use on an old church I've been trying to paint, but it always ends up looking a little brown. Have you got any advice? Well, Nick, I can show you this. Quite often for me, churches, especially around the part of the world that I live, sort of Derbyshire, Yorkshire area, tend to be more of a sandstone. So you're looking at a bit of a natural yellow kind of colour for this, which is a, a mixture of an ochre with a hint of grey, that sort of thing. So that's a good colour for that. But if you're talking grey church, you're talking more slate, maybe even granite. And a good colour for this is a mixture of viridian hue, which is a green of all things. Mix it with some red, some alizarin crimson, and you get this wonderful slate grey colour coming through. And it's nice because it gives you the mixture between the grey and the green, and you can control all this. And it makes a really nice effect, a really nice almost a sort of harsh grey and this will give you a nice effect on the church and you can control the amount of green, the amount of red because if you look close at slate you'll actually see that it contains a lot of those colours anyway. Different parts of the country do provide different slate colours. So I just very loosely block this in. What I tend to do then is use water on the brush dab it on a bit of tissue and then just use the water to soften all that in. So it also gives you a nice variation in colour tone as well as anything else. You don't need to have the same colour all the way through. The nice thing about watercolour is you can blend the tones on the paper, just like I'm doing at that point. So experiment with that and hopefully that will be the answer to your problem. Okay, folks, that's all we've got time for today. But remember, all the artistic advice and inspiration you need is just a click away. Visit the SAA website, which is saa.co.uk, for more information and resources available to support you on your creative journey. Join us next time when we'll be shining the introducing spotlight onto the work of SAA professional artist Michelle Weber. Maurice demonstrates how to paint a stunning pastel sunset. Mixed media artist Alison Board shares a top tip for adding a touch of texture to your works of art and I'll be returning to the Derbyshire countryside to show you how to use your camera to capture depth and detail in reference photographs. We'll see you soon for another exciting edition of A Splash of Paint. For a free splash of the bi-monthly paint magazine packed full of stimulating step-by-step -step guides, fantastic features and artistic advice from all your favourite TV artists, visit www.saa.co.uk.